Is there anything we can do to prevent Alzheimer's disease? So. Number one, absolutely. Um, one out of three cases of Alzheimer's disease may be preventable if that person does everything right. Now in the other two out of three cases, well, maybe we can't prevent it entirely, but can we delay it by six months, a year, two years, or five years or more? And if in that time that blockbuster drug comes, well then effectively that person prevented their own Alzheimer's disease by making very specific lifestyle, medical, and behavioral changes. Okay, now we hear a lot around lifestyle. Obviously everyone says sleep, exercise, um, diet, um, what is critical to making prevention work in your favor? Sure. So when it comes to lifestyle, you know, exercise is good for the brain. But what type of exercise? Every person needs to do something a little bit different. The one size fits all approach of Alzheimer's prevention, it's just not realistic. Exercise is good, but certain people need to do more cardiovascular exercise versus weight training. Well, how do we know? Well, know your numbers. In the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, we take the approach of the ABCs of Alzheimer's Prevention Management. A stands for anthropometrics, which is body composition, body fat. If someone has elevated body fat, well, they need to do specific targeted exercise to get that body fat down. As the belly size gets larger, the memory center in the brain gets smaller. The B for ABCs is the blood biomarkers, including genetics. We look at nutrition markers, we look at inflammation, we look at all sorts of things from metabolism to cholesterol. And importantly, we look at one specific gene called the APOE4 gene. Now, everyone gets APOE from their mom or their dad. They can get a two, a three, or a four. Some people can have one copy of four, other people can have two. Just 1% of the population has two. As you have more copies of E4, your risk of Alzheimer's disease goes up. And what we're learning now is, if someone has one or two copies of the APOE4 gene, different targeted interventions may work better or worse for that person. And then finally, when it comes to the ABC's cognitive function, it's really important to assess how someone's cognitive function is doing, how someone's memory, executive function, learning, and attention, and then follow that over time to give someone a targeted plan. What you're describing um, reminds me a lot of what precision medicine is. It's like really understanding how systems relate and where the risk factors are. So what would you recommend to someone who may be concerned, I mean, I have a mom with Alzheimer's disease. Um, if I'm concerned, what do I need to know about my body and functions in order to eliminate that risk? Eliminate, maybe not entirely, but minimize for sure. So first of all, know your numbers. Every single person out there needs to know what their blood pressure is, what their cholesterol is, what their blood sugar is, what, what their body fat is. They need to know about every single thing about themselves. They need to understand their vascular risk factors. So we talked about cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension. These are all things that can fast forward towards Alzheimer's disease. Other people also need to understand about their sleep. Well, are they sleeping how many hours? Is it quality sleep? Is it deep sleep? Is it REM sleep? These are all the idiosyncrasies that are important. Um, understanding what types of food people eat and what the reaction is to that food in, in, the, in the biological system. Uh, understanding responses to stress, understanding responses to a variety of interventions. So the key take home point here is a person should know their numbers, should talk to their doctor and try to intervene the lowest hanging fruit and try to do something that's brain healthy for them. Okay, and so all of these things that you describe though, you most people would go to the doctors and most doctors would not assess all of these things. How much can people find out to day through the current health system? Well, um, trying to have a conversation is, is the first step. Uh, you know, uh, our group was really the first uh, dedicated clinical program for Alzheimer's prevention in a one-on-one -on -one doctor to patient setting. But unfortunately, you're right. Um, you can't just go and, and knock uh, knock on the door of your doctor and say, how do I prevent Alzheimer's disease? Um, most doctors just aren't aware just yet. It takes 10 to 15 years for something proven in medical science to be translated into routine clinical practice. So the goal is, is to at least start the conversation. Uh, have your doctor um, at least talk to you about it. But of course, you can be an informed consumer. Um, you know, Google can find lots of things, good and bad. Um, our group has published several studies, including a recent study that really underscores the vital nature of individualized clinical management for Alzheimer's disease. And the take home point with all of this is there's not a one magic pill or one magic bullet. It's not a one size fits all approach. On average, our patients get 21 different interventions that target different realms of risk to try to reduce their overall risk. Let's talk about um, some of the more life lifestyle factors in, in more detail. I mean, you can see I'm wearing my Fitbit. Um, sleep, for example, is a big one. 
Um, it tells me REM, light sleep, deep sleep. What is critical for my brain with sleep? So different people need different things. And, um, you know, tracking these things is important. Again, know your numbers. Um, total sleep is a good place to start. Um, people should really get at least seven, seven and a half, even up to eight hours of sleep. And in that range, again, different people are different. Um, we probably have some degree of protection. When people start getting chronically sleeping four or five, six hours a night, the cumulative effect of that is really terrible on the brain. So I'll give you an example. Um, as you sleep, you have different stages of sleep. One of those is called deep sleep. Deep sleep is when the garbage gets taken out. Uh, it's really the amyloid, the bad toxic protein that builds up in the person, in, a, in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's, that amyloid basically gets disposed of. If you're really running on all cylinders and not getting enough deep sleep, the amyloid is more likely to build up and not get disposed of. Now, when it comes to REM sleep, REM sleep is also important, don't get me wrong, but maybe REM sleep is more important for the next day's cognitive function. REM sleep is when memories are consolidated during sleep. So sleep is complicated. Um, also, depending if you have an ApoE4 gene or not, um, ApoE4 positive people, whether I have one copy or two copies, really have a problem with amyloid. And uh, maybe those people need more deep sleep than people without that gene. When you evaluate if someone has the ApoE4 gene, you can also understand maybe what I need to do differently for that person. For example, if you have two copies, so there's homozygosity and hetero, so homo means two. If you have two copies of the ApoE4 gene, well, maybe those people need to be on vitamin D supplementation. And there's studies that show that maybe vitamin D is preferentially effective for people with two copies of the ApoE4 gene. If you have one copy of the ApoE4 gene, well, okay, maybe exercise is even more important for people with that gene versus someone without the gene. And maybe you have to titrate the exercise differently. Maybe someone without the ApoE4 gene, maybe 150 to 180 minutes a week, that's probably sufficient for Alzheimer's risk reduction and prevention. But someone that has an ApoE4 gene, whether you quote Erickson studies or a variety of other studies out there, honestly, you probably need more, 180, 210, even 240 minutes a week of exercise to negate or neutralize the negative impact of that gene. So what you're really describing is epigenetics, right? How a lifestyle and behavior can change our genetics or change how our genetics function, rather. Absolutely, and, and what people need to realize is that while ApoE is, is important, it, it, there's so many other things out there. There's so many other genes also that interact with ApoE. So if someone has one copy of ApoE4, okay, increases your risk a little bit, doesn't really bother me too much. But what if we look deeper in the genome? We have a, a family that, that all the family members are getting Alzheimer's disease in, the, in their 50s. Well, why is that? ApoE4 is a late onset gene where people should have symptoms in the 70s or, or 80s even. Well, that person had polygenic risk and a poor lifestyle, meaning epigenetics. So the person had ApoE4. There was another gene in this family that we found, the TNF-alpha gene, that when in, com and when in combination with ApoE4, it increases risk of Alzheimer's disease by six-fold. So then you add that with the insulin resistance, with the lack of exercise, with the borderline to high blood pressure. These are all things that fast forward a person to Alzheimer's disease. I've heard um, Alzheimer's uh, being described as a disease. Um, to treat Alzheimer's, it will be be much like HIV. Um, it will be a series of treatments isolating different things. Do you think that's the way, way we're headed? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think the, the cocktail is the only way that's possible. And, you know, in our cohort, in our study, uh, we showed that using 21 personally tailored, individually tailored for that person interventions at 18 months showed improved outcomes and, and really exciting outcomes from risk reduction for Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease to also improved cognitive function, especially in those people that followed greater than 60% of the recommendations. And these are people with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease with amyloid in their brain. If they followed 60% of the individualized recommendations at 18 months, they actually had better cognitive function. So when it comes to looking at the genes, uh, personalizing a plan, um, looking at other genes, looking at the biochemistry, looking at the person's biology, um, it's really essential. There won't really be a magic pill or a magic cure for Alzheimer's disease anywhere in the near future. And that pains me. I have four family members with Alzheimer's disease. I wish that wasn't the case, but I think someone getting really excited about a magic pill cure, it's just not gonna happen. A multimodal therapy 
therapies, lifestyle, like, like how we treat diabetes, how we treat HIV, how we treat other, other conditions. You need to do the multimodal approach. If people use this very pre precision tailored treatment to prevent Alzheimer's disease, how much can we pre prevent? Um, I can tell you we've been treating people for you know over five years now in the Alzheimer's prevention clinic. And if I had to go with my gut, but a non-perfectly scientific answer because we just haven't done the long-term studies, um, I would say in certain people we are pretty clearly delaying or plateauing uh, those patients uh, and basically going to go above and then delay the going back to baseline by at least four, six, eight, ten, even 12 years in some people. And that's significant. I mean, when you talk, think about getting Alzheimer's at 60 versus 70, that's a huge difference in life. Absolutely. And, and you know, our, our medical system and our research system, unfortunately, is not uh, set up to um, do these types of studies. Um, comparative effectiveness research, meaning real world research in a clinic, um, there is no funding, zero from the National Institutes of Aging, zero, on comparative effectiveness real-world research in Alzheimer's disease. I'm not surprised because research doesn't tend to focus on prevention. It's 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 really cure, right? And so. And uh, prevention, in my opinion, is a cure. Alzheimer's disease starts in the brain 20 to 30 years before the first symptom of memory loss. So that's when we have to intervene. Our, our patients are 25 and up.